Good evening, Namaste, welcome dear friends to today's class on Jesus Christ, his life and his teachings. Let us begin our class with a prayer. O oh Lord, make my heart big enough to hold thee, that it throb with the Christ consciousness in everything. Then shall I enjoy thy birth in my mind, in my soul and in every pulsing atom. Om Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. Let us invoke the presence of the Gurus by singing the hymn to Brahma. Mm. Thank you. 
Let's open our hearts and mind that the indwelling Lord may reveal himself to our awareness. Let's sit with a straightened spine, energy rising up with inhalation. Gaze at the point between the eyebrows. As we sit in silence, let us hear a few thoughts on even-mindedness by Swami Kriyananda, followed by an affirmation and prayer. Many people confuse progress with movement and with outward change. Thus, the more dust of excitement they can stir up, the more productive they feel they are. The more they get swept up into a happy mood when things go well, the better they imagine things have gone. And their answer to every slump is to cast about for some other thing to sweep them high once more. Such lives are like cars driven over deeply rutted roads. Their movement is almost as much up and down as it is forward. With even-mindedness, progress is a straight, not a jagged line. Progress, however, should mean, above all, progressive understanding. Even-mindedness bestows clarity of perception, which is the ability to see things as they really are, undistorted by emotional bias. Let us do the following affirmation. I remain untouched by gain or loss. In the calm mirror of my understanding, I behold thy light reflected. I remain untouched by gain or loss. In the calm mirror of my understanding, I behold thy light reflected. I remain untouched by gain or loss. In the calm mirror of my understanding, I behold thy light reflected. Mentally follow this prayer. When I rejoice, Lord, let it be with thee. And when I grieve, help me always to see thy sunlight through the mists. Om. Peace. Amen. So, dear friends, we come to our story section for the day. And the life story that I have brought today for discussion with you is the story of Saint Teresa of Avila. And uh, Master has also mentioned Saint Teresa a couple of times, especially in reference to her vision of the formless Christ. So uh, she was born in 1515 in uh, Spain and the place was called Avila. And her grandfather was basically a Jew who was forced to convert to Christianity. But he did convert eventually. And of course, then the father was a Christian. Her mother was a very devout Christian. And uh, she would tell them stories, the children's stories of uh, saints and would take them to church all the time. So inspired by the stories of saints, uh, when uh, Saint Teresa was seven years of age, she and her brother, they thought that, you know, they are going to join the the people who are fighting with the Moors, the Moors were like the invaders in Spain trying to convert into, uh, again, uh, the, the conquest of the Muslims and uh, other people was happening at that time. So the children, seven years age, of age, they ran away from home in to support Christianity and to support Christ. But then their uncle saw them at the periphery of the village and they he brought them back. But anyway, so just to say that they were they were really, you know, Christian at heart and uh, they would participate in all activities. So when uh, St. Teresa was 11 years of age, her mother passed away. And of course, uh, she it was a drawback for her. 
And uh, it is th at that time that she developed a very beautiful relationship with Virgin Mary. And she would consider Mary as her spiritual mother. And her uh, faith and her connection with the mother deepened a lot at that time. So when she was 19 to 20 years of age, uh, she joined the, uh, the, the convent that was there and she became a nun at a very early age of 19 and 20. So she was from the Carmelite order. Uh, now she was, since she had heard a lot about the sacrifices so many saints had made uh, to, you know, for the love of Christ. So she did believe in a, in a strict discipline, but also in certain kind of modifications, as in, you know, a, a severe um, tapasya, as you would say, you know, like not eating too much or even giving difficulty to the body, like being in the cold too much or, you know, trying to handle extremes of weather extremes of physical conditions to do develop that uh, love for christ so she was in favor of that but um, to some extent that led her to fall sick for two to three years continuously in fact there was a point when she was on her deathbed and but later she she re recovered from that and uh, then she says that those two three years where she was on the bed she had many many mystical visions and uh, her relationship with christ deepened at that time okay so um and uh, later it is said that uh, you know she wrote many many books uh, like the interior castle the the uh, way to perfection and so on which are even now they are available in the market even on amazon you can get them and they're beautiful books. They're very deep and mystical. So it kind of takes a little bit effort to break through the eyes of the wordings that she has used uh, or strict, you know, gra grammatical uh, way. But uh, uh, they are very nice books. Anyway, so um, she had a lot of mystical experiences during that time. And I will just read out a few of her experiences uh, that she had. So it is uh, said that uh, there's something called transverberation means it's like a mystical grace so she once had the vision that a golden spear was entering her heart and as it entered the heart it was very painful but what that did was it took out all the darkness from her heart it took out all her negativities and it moved out from there releasing her and giving her such a beautiful feeling that she did not and she had this vision multiple times and she did not mind the pain she felt when the spear would enter her heart because she knew that it would then free her eventually and she would just rejoice in that feeling so that was one of her visions Another, of course, uh, the experience that St. Teresa would have was that in intense prayer, she would start to levitate. So the master has also mentioned this. So she would levitate and as she would rise, her fellow nuns would have to pull her, you know, uh, her habit. The habit is the dress that they would they have to pull it down and to bring her on the, uh, the chairs that they were there in the church. So this would happen to her very often. And then, of course, she had the experience of the formless Christ uh, means uh, uh, she explained that how she felt the abstract love and the presence of Christ. But in Initially, uh, the, her seniors would not believe her, but then eventually it was discovered that St. Thomas of Aquinas had also mentioned about the formless Christ. And then uh, it was reconciled that probably she is having those visions. A very interesting uh, vision that she once had was that she a, a saintly figure once appeared to her in her meditation. And uh, uh, as she looked at that saintly figure, she was trying to figure out who it was. So she prayed to that figure and he said, and she asked it, him, uh, he says, she said, who are you? And the reply, um, uh, first, so the, the, the saint, the, the appear, one who had appeared, he said, first, you tell me, who are you? And she said, I am Teresa of Jesus. And uh, the figure smiled. And uh, when then Teresa said, okay, now who are you? And the figure replied back to her, I am Jesus of Teresa. So such is the love of, of the devotee and the Lord that the Lord says, 
that I belong to you. When the, the devotee says fully and sincerely meaning that, Lord, I belong to you, then the Lord says fully with full sincerity and love that I too belong to you. So such was her love with Jesus, with Christ, with Mother Mary. And she was, you know, um, very well respected at her time. Uh, but as always, whenever in any religious order, whenever a new person tries to rise, and there is, of course, some religious and political problems that happen. So uh, same similar things happened in her time because she was, as we said, a very um, much disciplinarian. And at that time, the monasteries and uh, the, the nunneries were not very well maintained in the sense they had forgotten the purity and the, the vows of poverty and you know chastity that um, monks and nuns were supposed to take. But she was very strict with it and she introduced her that order into the church. Some people were definitely against it. But then with the, eventually with the help of the king of that time, uh, she was <laughs> able to you know, set those reforms in place. And not one, two, but she helped to open 16 convents. And then um, she said, met some monks amongst whom was John of the Cross. And then John of the Cross was the one person who started these reforms in the male monastery. So uh, St. Teresa was working with the females. And now John of the Cross, he started to work with the males and those reforms, that purity, that prayerful connection, all of that was brought back to the uh, monastery and the nunnery. And then, of course, she wrote many books. She traveled extensively. And uh, um, even though her health was not very good uh, during the last time, yet she continued to travel and open many, many more convents in her lifetime. And um, in last days basically she was uh, she was traveling from uh, some place back to avila and uh, she died on the way so somebody wrote down the last words that she said and her last words were my lord it is time to move on well then may your will be done o oh, my lord and my spouse the hour that I have longed for has come. It is time to meet one another. Om. So such is the beauty of, of the life of St. Teresa. She still continues to inspire so many people, but just appreciate and take to heart the love that she had for, for Jesus, the love that she had for the Lord and that uh, whatever happened, she just took it joyfully. And she was the one who actually said uh, a sad nun is a bad nun. So not only on the one hand, she was a reformist and a disciplinarian, but she knew that when you are in love with the Lord, then you have to have joy inside your heart. And whatever you do for the Lord, that you must do with joyful willingness. So with all those principles and with that beautiful love in her heart, she uh, outlined a life for us as well. And when she talks about the interior castle, she talks about seven levels of how when we pray, what, what are these levels of consciousness that we feel, feel inside of us? As in, see, when we, we are just verb verbally saying a prayer, and then what do we feel inside? And then when we go in towards the silence, then what happens? So she basically guides the nuns to go more one level more further into the inside till uh, a person feels oneness with the infinite Christ. Okay, so now we come back to the story of the New Testament. And in the last class, we studied that how after having uh, given giving the Sermon on the Mount, when Jesus descends into back into Capernaum, into the villages, he's followed by thousands of people. And then once when he's sitting in a house and there's a paralytic man who needs to be healed, then people who have faith in Jesus, they actually break through the roof and descend that paralytic man. And he says, thy sins are forgiven or stand up and take thy bed and walk. And then again, the scribes and Pharisees are watching him and ask him, who is he to forgive sins? And then again, uh, he goes and into an, uh, another house of where, where publicans are there, where political people are there, some sinners are there, I means local, not so noble people are there. 
And then again, people are asking me, why are you sitting with them? Why are you breaking bread with these people? And he says clearly that the, it is the sick people who need the physician more than the healthy people. And I have come to uplift all of these people who actually need me more. So uh, it, he, he doesn't mind that if somebody has sinned, he's offering his mercy, his love and forgiveness to all alike and especially those who need him all the more. And then he keeps walking and then he comes uh, in contact with Matthew and looking at Matthew who's a tax collector, he just says, follow me. And in that instant, Matthew leaves everything and starts following Jesus. So this is where we are now. Now, by this time, all the 12 apostles have joined him. And this is what the gospel says. And it came to pass in those days that he went out into a mountain to pray and continued all night in prayer to God. And when it was day, he called unto him his disciples, and of them he chose twelve, whom also he named apostles, Simon, who he named Peter, Andrew, his brother, James and John, Philip and Bartholo, Matthew and Thomas, James the son of Alphaeus, and Simon, and Judas, the brother of James, and Judas Iscariot, which was also the traitor. So one of them eventually uh, betrayed Jesus. And then a master explains that how he would have decided on keeping these 12 and what would have happened. So master says, the choosing of the 12 apostles by Jesus from amongst his disciples has a very significant meaning. In the Guru disciple tradition in India, each master who attains God consciousness has two kinds of devotees who come to him for spiritual training. Those married or unmarried who come for general instruction are called students. But the, those students who dedicate their entire lives to the pursuit of God realization and who are thereby enjoined to propagate the teaching of the master to the world of the master to the world through the example of their spiritual development are called disciples. The very act of living for God alone is in itself a sermon to the world, eloquent beyond the finest oratory. The duly ordained teacher who possesses both a holy life and a clarity in conveying truth is a true apostle of the master sent forth to serve for him as pure voice of his God-given message. Jesus selected his disciples for three reasons. First, because they had not reached but were near the final state of realization and therefore he wanted to assist them in the attainment of perfection. Second, after reawakening their past spiritual potential for reaching the final state of emancipation, Jesus required their assistance as apostles or model disciples who could be pioneers to propagate the message of Christhood to the masses through ideal living. And third, Jesus knew according to the plan of the Heavenly Father that he would have 12 disciples, particularly these particular 12, to carry out the message to the world. So three things master is saying first is that he, those 12 people were near to realization in their past lives they had good karma and they had they were almost at the brink of realization and jesus came at that time to just push them nudge them a bit towards final uh, realization and liberation the second reason is that uh, Jesus wanted those advanced disciples who would then, because his knew, he knew his life was limited and the message had to go through centuries. So he needed powerful souls who were in tune with him so that they would dedicate their lives to, to Christhood, to Christ consciousness, and then they would become examples instead and the flow of the teachings would go on. And the third is because it was already prophesied, it was written in the scriptures that such and such would be the case. So to fulfill the predestined prophecy, he selected those 12 disciples. Now, the coming of Judas, there is Judas Iscariot, there were two Judas. So the coming of Judas Iscariot into the company of the chosen of the Christ distinctly shows that a disciple is given every spiritual opportunity of a master's blessings, 
yet has the independence to work against the will of God. So God is going to be merciful at all times. He is going to be giving us a chance all time. But in spite of having the blessings of a great master, the, the actual battle of choosing right versus wrong will stay with us. The free will, the choice that has been given to us will remain active. And we can still choose to be in attunement with the master or leave the path and try to do something else. Jesus knew the law of cause and effect and the evil propensities of the karma of Judas. So he could predict the probability of his betrayal, but still out of his love for his disciples, he chose Judas Iscariot. It should be clearly understood that it was not a God-ordained fate of Judas to betray Jesus. Rather that Judas insinuated himself into the villainous role according to the lawful effect of his prenatal actions that predisposed him to be the cause of the betrayal of Christ. So what is master saying here? So it's not that a God somewhere decided that let me glorify Jesus and because I want to glorify Jesus, let me put one person down, let him behave like this so that my son is you know glorified. It was not like, like that. So master is saying that past karma of Judas Iscariot, his prenatal tendencies were such that he was somehow attracted to this, the very deal of betraying Jesus. So actually, if we think, if we th think about the thoughts that Judas Iscariot was having. So initially Judas was, uh, he wanted to uh, uh, free the Jews from of the Romans on the one hand. And he wanted, of course, he was also waiting for the Messiah. But he had a business-related mind. He had that he was that person who was attached to name, fame, and money. And it is because and he was thinking that if he went to the Romans, then probably the ministry of Jesus would you know he would have name and fame, and then his ministry would spread uh, like that. But uh, that was his own personal thought process because of his prenatal tendencies. Now, if any such thought was coming to him and if he was really sincere, he would have asked the permission of Jesus to do what he was about to do. But that he did not. He was not in tune with Jesus very much and he did not care to take permission of the guru, of the living master, to ask him what should be done. Instead, he went in his own personal ways and that eventually caused for the betrayal of Jesus and eventually after Jesus was crucified even Judas he hung himself on on a tree so anyway so so uh, this is this story reminds us that at every point we do have a free choice at every point even though we may have some prenatal tendencies we may be attracted to the temptations of this world but we still have our free will through which we need to attune ourselves to the master because only the master knows our past karma and only the master can modify the present so that the future may be modified for us. So whenever we are in confusion and we are, do not know right from wrong, then it is time to pray, meditate deeply, pray to the master, ask for his guidance and do not act until you receive that guidance because especially if the decision is a, one of life's important decisions. Under the divine influence of Jesus, Judas had the opportunity to change his karmic pattern, but he heeded the voice of his egoic satanic ignorance rather than Christ's wisdom. God puts his devotees through great tests and Judas failed this one miserably. Yet, such is the paradox that it was Judas who participated precipitated the culminating victory of Jesus' life that showed to the world for ages to come the immortality of Christ. So yet, uh, since again it is the world of duality, uh, although Judas did what he had, what he did and he suffered for that, but it was again because of Judas that uh, Jesus was in fact glorified. That is a side thing that did happen. Like, you know, sometimes they say that 
the greatness of ram can should also be you know the contributors important contributors was rani kekai and mantara so it hadn't if they hadn't behaved the way they had behaved then rama wouldn't have gone to the forest and he would not there would not have been fight between ram and ravana so many uh, asuras would not have been killed and therefore the glory of rama would not have come forth so something on that line uh, we can just speak now that it is a past incident but if you if you put yourself in the shoes of judas any of us could have you know thought the way judas has thought because we are conditioned to think more intellectually rather than following our heart rather than going in inward and attuning to the guru we tend to do what our ego says more because of past conditioning so now in this life when we have a god realized master in our life then we must walk very very carefully and we must listen to our own heart because god is sitting in our own heart and we must keep praying to the master to help us okay and the gospel now continues and he came down with them and stood in the plain and the company of his disciples and a great multitude of people out of all judea and jerusalem and from the sea coast of tyre and sidon which came to hear him and to be healed of their diseases and they that were uh, vexed with unclean spirits and they were all healed and the whole multitude sought to touch him for there went virtue out of him and healed them all and he lifted up his eyes on his disciples and said blessed be ye pure for yours is the kingdom of god blessed are ye that hunger now for ye shall be filled blessed are ye that weep now for ye shall laugh blessed are ye when men shall hate you and when they shall separate you from their company and shall reproach you and cast out your name as evil for the son of man's sake rejoice ye on that day and leap for joy for behold your reward is great in heaven for in the like manner did their fathers unto the prophets but woe unto you that are rich for ye have received your consolation woe unto you that are full for ye shall hunger woe unto you that laugh now for ye shall mourn and weep woe unto you when all men shall speak well of you for so did their fathers to the false prophets now this is a beautiful uh, stanza and here we first we have the sermon on the mount this is also called the sermon on the plain and here he is uh, telling people on who is blessed so whoever is downtrodden whoever is weak whoever is poor he is trying to uplift all of them and he is telling them that that all their tapasya that all their difficulty and challenges in this life will turn another leaf and other things will happen so we must remember that this is a life of duality the ocean waves are going to rise and fall so people who are suffering at the present moment may have you know a change of fate later and they will enjoy the other side of the coin as well so he is basically giving them consolation to the people who are hungry is not saying leave everything and become god conscious so he is being very very practical for people who are in tears they need peaceful consolation of the heart so he is giving to the people what they most need at that time and it is after incarnations of being with the guru that one realizes that both the good and the bad have to be given up but we are talking when the peak of the kali yuga was happening and that time people were matter bound and all that mattered to them was a, a relatively comfortable life a relatively of course with the love of god in their heart so they were going through many hardships and that's what jesus he consoled them he encouraged them he told them that things will change for you on the other hand he is now also addressing the people who are already the rich and the famous people who are just making merry of their lives who are just partying and who are you know just people who are being praised who are having name and fame so he's saying woe unto you because the opposite is going to happen to you so uh, it's does this does not mean that people who are well off are going to become poor in the next life but what it means is people who are well off 
and who are selfish at the same time, means who are, who are not sharing the gifts that they have received with others. In fact, it was a time where people had slaves and people would really treat them very, very badly. So in such a time, Jesus is simply warning them not to be attached to whatever good they have. So it's simply a message that even if your life is good at the moment and it is because of your past karma. So if you have a good job, if you have a good position, if you have even if, if you're good looking, if you have some position in society, it's all because of past karma. But if you are just wasting your position at this time, if you are just wasting your wealth at this time, just partying and just having some drinks and thinking that life is just you know, a merry ride and let me just have a good time and that's it. That's not the case. Because unless you are God realized, the dual aspect is going to happen. So don't while away your time, your energy, your wealth. But use that as a stepping ladder to another higher zone of consciousness. So share whatever you have to uplift yourself and others. And then, of course, the reward is going to be according to that. And eventually, we have to go beyond all rewards of good and bad. So uh, when, you, when you look around and you find that, you know, this is a common question that people ask. Why do good people suffer only? So it's, of course, there is the law of karma and some past things have to be broken even. But even those people who appear to be enjoying themselves are leading very, very shallow lives. They have hardly a touch of true unconditional love in their life, unconditional joy in their life, or any streak of wisdom. They'd have none of it. And eventually those are losers because what we... Our treasure, as Jesus said in this life, is the inner treasure. And people who are just happy with the outer treasures are going to lose, lose everything at the time of death. So actually, they are poor inside. They, they may not realize it. So when you meet people like this, surround them. Just You can keep blessing them as, as well because they don't know where they are headed. Master then says, in contrast to the blessed ones who seek the reward of heaven, woe unto those who are so satisfied with their material rewards that they foolishly do not seek the all misery quenching fountainhead of everlasting bliss. So the downside of having material prosperity in this life is that you do not seek God. Just look around you. You will find that people who are extremely rich have hardly Hardly they have any need or want the true yearning for God and for freedom because they think they have attained what they want. And that is the basically the pitfall and that eventually they fall into that pit. By his words, woe unto you that are rich. He condemned not the possession of wealth, but attachment to earthly treasure and selfish hoarding without sharing with others in need. Possessiveness makes one callous to the sufferings of others and gives one, one a false sense of security. The rubies cannot prevent the advent of disease or catastrophe of death. To be satisfied with wealth given, gives one the false consolation that he has everything, whereas he really has very little, and even that is only given to him for temporary use to be instantly taken away when the time comes to leave this world. The only prosperity, Master says, that one takes with him is his treasure trove of wisdom and bliss from the realization of truth in meditation. When Jesus says, Woe unto you that laugh now, it does not mean that you should not laugh at all. <laughs> Material pleasures must not counteract your desire for spiritual pleasures. That is what is meant here. So yes, it's okay to laugh. It's okay to meet friends and give them love. But always remember that this is not the ultimate treasure. This was not the purpose for which you came into this life. So always keep your goal as you know, God bliss. And that is the treasure that we are seeking. And little by little, we accumulate that in our life until the moment comes where uh, with the help of the Guru, we become enlightened and we realize that, yes, it was mine already. 
But till that moment, we have to keep working and keep collecting those rubies and of peace and the diamonds of love and joy that come to us with meditation. And as we meditate regularly, they overflow into our daily lives. And then, of course, the we continue with the gospel. And he says, and Jesus says now, For a good tree bringeth not forth corrupt fruit, neither doth a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. For every tree is known by his own fruit. For of thorns men do not gather figs, nor of a bramble bush gather their grapes. So, um, Master goes on to explain this verse. And in simple language, uh, a tree is known by its fruit. So uh, in our life, fr frankly speaking, what is happening right now is the fruit of some action that we initiated in the past. Whatever fruits we get to eat now in terms of the life that we are leading has, was planted somewhere back. And therefore, now that you know that every fruit is a result of your own plantation, you make sure that you sow the seeds of the fruit that you eventually want to eat later. So if you want to eat the fruit of divine joy, of love and of self-realization, then now is the time to sow those seeds and to actually water them daily. Because every seed that you sow in the soil of your heart and your soul is going to give its eventual fruit. That's a guarantee. So uh, the, the tree will be known by the fruit. So if you're if you're a joyful person right now, means you have worked at becoming joyful. If you're a spiritual person in this life, you have worked with spirituality earlier. So this is the fruit that you're eating. And now we want this fruit of self-realization to multiply to the point where we feel completely free. Now master explains this. He says, uh, the reference to a tree and its fruit has not only a lateral connotation, but there is a metaphysical meaning. And what is this metaphysical meaning? He says, a human being is a composite of three kinds of trees. The physical nervous system. Now think of the anatomy of the human nervous system. It's like a branching tree, isn't it? And the roots are in the brain and the trunk is in the spine and the efferent and afferent nerves are branching out from him, from the spine with the senses and sensations at the end of the nerve branches as fruits. Now, this is an exact corroboration with the uh, Ashwatta tree that Krishna mentions in the Bhagavad Gita. In, in the Gita, we studied how the human nervous system or the astral system is like an inverted tree where the roots are up in the brain and that from there the nourishment from the cosmos is coming. Then the spine is the trunk of the tree. Then the leaves and all the branches and the leaves are the, the sense and the motor organs. And the fruits are the sense um, feelings, the, the, the actual uh, contact of the sense uh, objects with the sense organs and the feeling of the senses like the taste and the the fragrance that we smell, the ability to move, all of that. So those are the fruits. And the second level of tree that Master mentions is an astral tree of life with its roots as a thousand petal press. So we know at the Sahasrara is the thousand petal lotus. So now Master is saying that the next level of the tree is that astral tree. Again, with the roots, the roots are the thousand petal lotus at the Sahasrara. And... Um, its trunk of the force, life force in the Sushumna and the astral spine and bird branches of life force with life-giving fruits of vitality and subtle perceptions. Those are the branches and the leaves. So here now we are talking of the subtle naris, the astral naris, which have been numbered by as I think 72,000 naris in all have been made in a map of, of uh, the astral body and we are talking of those now and that is also like a tree again with the the root here at the sahasrara we are drawing all our energy we have descended from the cosmos we have entered the energy entered through our spines and, and it got locked at the base of the spine which is the kundalini and then this whole tree keeps functioning till of course the life force is then withdrawn and it goes out again 
And the third is the tree of consciousness. So we are becoming more and more, you know, subtle. From the physical tree of nervous system, we went to the astral tree or the energy tree of the astral spine and sushumna. And now we are talking of the tree of consciousness, which has its roots in the intelligence, again, at the upper part of the body, in the head. Its trunk consists of the mind and the branches consists of reason, will and feeling. It bears the fruit of evil and good desires. So multiple levels. So he's talking about now the mental level of the tree. That when we have our mind, we have a man, buddhi, amkara, chitta, where we are you know, uh, fighting the battle every day. And the fruits are according to whatever action we do, the fruit of it is evil or good. As an aggregate, these three systems of nerves, life energy and consciousness constitute the tree of life in man. At a macrocosmic scale means the whole cosmic level, God can be sp spoken of as the root of the universal tree of life. The cosmic energy can be spoken of as the trunk and all rays shooting out of this cosmic energy for the creation can be called as branches. The worlds and universes of causal, astral and physical constitution are the fruits of the tree of cosmic consciousness. So here we are forced to think at a level uh, beyond our normal thinking. So normally we are so preoccupied with just this body, the duties of this body, the sensations of this body, the pain and pleasure of this body, our relationships, our daily duties. That's all that concerns us on a daily level. But step back, Master says, and understand how this tree of life coming from God and descending in as energy and then manifesting as matter is so many parallel and superimposed tree of life, trees of life are there that our attention does not go to them. And it would do us good if we would try to see things at a cosmic scale. Then our little life will come in the right perspective. Our little problems will come in the right perspective when we would, can actually understand the vastness of this universe. And if, if I am a superimposition of so many trees, every human being walking on this planet is the same manifestation of the same one God with so many parallel trees of life in each individual. Okay. Now the gospel continues. Jesus says, A good man out of the good treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is good. And an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is evil. For in the abundance of the how, heart, his mouth speaketh. So naturally, uh, you, you, what you speak is a direct representation of what you feel in your heart. So if you have evil thoughts in your mind, if you have hatred and jealousy in your heart, then when you will speak, not only the content of your speak, but the very tone of your speech, the very vibration of the, the speech gives to others is going to have that vibration of that evil thought that you harbor in your mind and similarly if you are an overall good person then uh, it, this is going to reflect in your speech if you have been reading books on spirituality if you are talking about god if you are singing to the lord then when you speak to other people what you have stored in you is going to come out so whatever is in your heart and mind that is what you're going to speak and you would have uh, felt it by now that you know when you were not on the spiritual path and you would meet people you would talk about general the movie the weather the mall the shopping the the sales and so on but after having come to the spiritual path and having enjoyed the peace and joy some fruits out of it now when you talk to people you automatically tend to introduce master you tend to introduce the autobiography of a yogi you tend to talk about meditation or kriya yoga or yoga in general anything that elevates the consciousness of the person that you are talking with and you also like talking like that so you have changed from inside and how that speech the the content of the speech has changed because what you put into your heart has changed you have you are now in the company of the master you are now in the company of his teachings and therefore when you speak you speak from that treasure which is in your heart and mind 
okay so uh, this is another pointer to say that if somebody is speaking you with you in anger and irritation so you should realize that this is what he has in his heart and you cannot no point judging him you can you can forgive him you can bless him that he may be freed of his anger and irritation but it's very very simple that whoever speaks whatever things is coming from this his own storehouse and secondly master also says just like speech is a mirror of what is in your heart and mind your eyes are also a mirror of what is in the heart and mind and the master says it is not just the result of one incarnation uh, whatever your eyes express is actually a result of many incarnations of thinking and feeling that way so if a person has soft and loving eyes is because he has been or she has been a soft and loving uh, person for his life or many lifetimes and for somebody who has cruel and piercing eyes is because he ha or she has harbored those kind of thoughts for more one at least one or more than one incarnations so now uh, when you are clear about this, you can easily a devotee or a disciple when in the midst of many people, just take a moment to feel out other people and don't cross your paths with anybody and everybody. Be careful with whom you exchange your magnetism or your vibration with. And if you are unable to feel it out yourself, just take a pause and in that moment, ask master, master, should I interact with so-and-so person? If it is a choice, that is. Sometimes we just have to face the other person. But you ask master, should I interact with this person? With what attitude should I interact with this person? So uh, remember during times of when master was alive and uh, a devotee's brother wanted to just fight with master and master already knew. So it, uh, master did not want him to come and so that he would explain to him, no, no, I'm doing the right thing. No, nothing doing. Master saw him coming. He warned that person not to enter the room. And when the person started to wanted to enter the room, he felt that he was on fire. So you don't have to be soft and you know listen to everybody polite to everybody know what you are you know who is in front of you sometimes the satanic influence can really affect you through others so be again watchful be very careful whom you are meeting what you are talking talking with them what magnetism is being changed if the magnetism of the evil person is stronger than your uh, spiritual magnetism then you are going to be affected the larger magnet stronger magnet is going to affect the lesser magnet. So please make sure that you interact with the right people and in your heart you will know. And if suppose you have to interact with people who are not so nice, just keep master in your heart and just ask him to help you to behave appropriately. And that's all. And you can leave it at that. And then forget it. Don't keep thinking about the conversation with you had with some person who did, you did not like or who had some evil propensities. Forget it. File closed, move on. To again come back to the teachings if you're feeling restless someday come back home open the autobiography come into the vibration of the master's fold and then your heart will settle down and you will feel happy about it okay. Okay, so we move on now to the next discourse by jesus and this is very interesting this is a bit long. I'll read it first and then we'll uh, try and understand what it means. And one of the Pharisees desired him that he would eat with him. And he went out into the Pharisee's house and sat down to eat. And behold, a woman in the city, which was a sinner, when she saw that Jesus sat at meat in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster bowl of ointment and stood at his feet behind him weeping and began to wash his feet with tears, and did wipe them with the hair of her head, and kissed his feet, and anointed them with ointment. Now when the Pharisees which had bidden him saw it, he spake within himself, saying, This man, if he was a prophet, would have known who and what manner of woman this is who toucheth him, for she is a sinner. And Jesus answering said unto him, Simon, I have somewhat to say unto thee. 
and he said, Master, say on. So now Jesus is knowing that the Pharisees and scribes are watching him, that a sinner woman, whatever, and there's no need for us to judge what that means, but a, a low caste sinner woman is basically trying to touch Jesus and the Pharisees are again saying, why is he allowing her to touch them? And then to answer them, he is talking to his disciple Simon so that he can clarify what he's saying. And then he tells Simon a story. This is the story. There was a certain creditor which had two debtors. The one owed 500 pence and the other 50 pence. And when they had nothing to pay, he frankly forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him more? Simon answered and said, I suppose that he to whom he forgave the most. And he said, and Jesus then said, you have judged rightly. So the story is that if, if I owe a particular person 500 rupees and another person owes the same person 5 lakh rupees and he basically, the other person forgives us both. We have no money, so he forgives us both. So who will feel more indebted? The person for him 5 lakh rupees was spared, that is going to feel you know, more helped by the by the person who has forgiven, isn't it, naturally? So this is an indicator that if a person who has been sinning and in fact has a lot of karmic burden, if that person is forgiven, of course that person is at least sincere and asking for to be forgiven. In that case, if that person is relieved of his karmic burden, then he will be having more faith and more love towards the Lord. And such was the case with that lady. That lady was herself burdened with her own sins that she wanted to feel free in her heart. And she had heard so much over the time about Jesus that he was the Messiah and that it was he who can forgive her, who can help her out of this mess. And therefore she reaches that place with a very expensive an ointment in her hand and then she falls down at his feet. She starts to cry and spill her heart and she is washing his feet with her tears. She is cleaning his feet with her own hair and then she kisses his feet and she puts that expensive ointment at, on his feet. Such is her love and her trust and faith that he can redeem her. And then however bad her load of karma, Jesus just blesses her and he forgives her. But the others are watching and they are not understanding. And Jesus turned to the woman and said unto her, Seest thou this woman? I entered into this house and he, the, the person, so he's, he's now talking to the person who is the host. He says, you gave me no water for my feet, but she has washed my feet with tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman has uh, kissed my feet. So he's showing, talking about showing love to him. This woman hath anointed my feet with ointment. Wherefore I say unto thee, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. So here is an, again, if any of us feels that we have some karmic burden, and we feel it is heavy. Even if we feel it is not heavy, we have some karmic burden. So we can literally do what this woman has done. It doesn't matter. We don't have to count our own faults and errors. We can just forget that. But we can fall down at the feet of the Lord. We can love him with our heart, with the tears from falling from the eyes. Now, the tears are basically an expression of the heart's love and surrender. So when with that love and surrender, if we fall at the feet of the Lord, if we just love him and we say that we, he has to redeem us, that he has to free us, he has to liberate us, he has to bring us to his home, to his abode, he has to make us one with him. If with that love, surrender, trust, faith and letting go, if we do that, then Jesus will will give us what we want. And in fact, a point comes where your devotee doesn't want anything. In fact, uh, in, in the Shastras, it is said that some uh, some people love the bhakti mark so much. Some people, the devotees love the, the duality of the bhakta and Bhagavan so much that they don't want to have oneness with Bhagavan because then they will lose that love relationship that they have with God. 
so but then those saints are god realized already they are one with the lord but they like to play that duality of bhakta and bhagavan so that is the case but so if we love so both bhakti and gyan can bring us to god when we are one pointed in love with the lord he gives us the wisdom that we are already one with him and if we go through the gyan marg and we introspect and we inquire as to who we really are then also we reach the lord so both the pathways will take us to the lord and whatever is our own temperament some of us may be very loving and very devoted so for us love works love is the way and love is the goal for others we like to intellectually find logic into who we really are for them gyan works then there are others who can work good with their physical bodies for them karma yoga works offering every little action to the lord with love with joy with will power with surrender offering all the fruits so for them karma yoga works all these paths are going to take us to that one infinite and according to our temperament we can choose any of the paths that are laid there okay now uh, very interestingly i'll just uh, end the story that we did today that, that jesus said that the now he has the the um, person has forgiven the debt that was incurred on others now this very person suppose somebody has forgiven my debt of 1 lakh rupees and now i have also uh, given some debt to my servant and now when my servant comes to me and i if i am very very harsh to that servant and if i don't forgive the debt of that servant now which is probably 1000 rupees or 2000 rupees my debt of 1 lakh rupees has been forgiven but i refuse to forgive the debt of 1000 2000 rupees which i gave to my servant then what will happen and this is what jesus again says he will he in in the language of the gospel this is how he continues the story that if now you do not forgive others then the same debt will come back on to you so be careful if you want that the lord should forgive you for your errors for your mistakes then be sure to forgive others for their mistakes if you want that the lord should have a big heart to accommodate you then you should have a big heart to accommodate the people around you if you want that god should not judge you then you be the one not to judge anybody if you want that the lord should bring down his hand up from the heaven down to lift you up then have you brought your hand down to uplift the downtrodden ones whether in terms of financial help or intellectual help whether in terms of giving them a job in some way have you put your hand down to uplift any downtrodden person in your life if you want the lord to love you unconditionally have you yourself been able to give unconditional love to your enemy ask yourself these questions whatever you want of the lord you must be that yourself and the channel will then be blessed by what flows through it automatically with that thought uh, let us just end today's class and let us share these beautiful and powerful teachings with all souls everywhere let us pray together divine mother beloved lord jesus thou art omnipresent thou art in all thy children manifest thy healing presence in all bodies all minds and all souls oh divine mother beloved christ may thy love shine forever on the sanctuary of our devotion and may we be able to awaken thy love in all hearts om shanti shanti shanti